or tonight or whatever time it is in whichever part of the world you're at, we're excited that you're here. You can probably see um, Joseph Merrill on the screen and he's going to be doing our webinar tonight about the U.S. visa process. So, so he was an, an uh, how would you say it, Joan, an ex-vice consul officer? I was a vice consul. I'm a former vice consul. Okay, perfect. So he has done this before and he's worked with students and done the visa interviews before, so he's going to give us an inside scoop. And yes. He currently works with the Boutique Universities Consortium, which we have um, five different schools in our consortium, so we're excited to talk to you a little bit tonight. Yep. So, no, thank you, Emma, for the introduction. Uh, I'm Joe Merrill. I am a former uh, U.S. diplomat and vice consul. Uh, <clears throat> I used to manage a visa team. Uh, my visa team, was re uh, we issued about 70,000 visas a year. Uh, and so I've had uh, more than my share of student visa interviews and uh, have spent a lot of time working with all manner of, uh, of what would be called non-immigrant visas. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about the, the student visa process. And I'm going to be sharing with you kind of uh, a view from inside the embassy of <clears throat> what the student visa process is like. And I want to try to give your students some advice on some things that they can do that will help them when they apply for uh, their visas. Now, uh, let's see, we've got uh, a little presentation here. <clears throat> you know, the overview here is really just, you know, what are the qualifications for a U.S. visa? Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about 214B, which is how most students get refused. Uh, those of you who have been in this, you know, in this industry for a while, uh, you're, you're very familiar with 214B. That's the number one reason uh, students get refused. And we're going to have some interview tips. So if I could start <clears throat> with uh, the folks who are here listening, uh, you have a little chat area on your screen. You guys see the chat area? Oh, I'll type a little message here. Uh, you should feel free <coughs> to use this space right now. So if I could, I'd like to ask, uh, ask you, uh, for, for those people who are watching, what percentage of uh, students who apply for a visa, uh, what percentage of those students do you think are receive their visas? So if you were to guess, what percentage of student visas for a first-time applicant, uh, what percentage get their visas, if you were to guess? So I see Aparna and Anna both put messages. So Aparna, Anna, and everybody else on the call, uh, what, what, if you had to guess, uh, what percentage of uh, people, first-time applicants, get their visa? You guys can type it into the chat window. So I'll even put here, what? percentage of first-time student visa applicants receive a visa. So this is based on actual data. What percentage do you think it is? You can guess. It's OK. 60%, 80%. Natalia, that's a good guess. Aparna, good guess. 80%, 50%. Yeah, so those are all really good guesses. So the actual number is 77%. So for a first-time applicant, uh, you know, globally, the average is 77%. Now, most people would guess that that actually is a lot lower. And <clears throat> I think that there's a lot of misperceptions uh, about those visa rates. Now, there, there is some variance in, you know, student visa issuance by country, but it usually doesn't vary a whole lot unless you're in a very high-risk country like Nigeria. And I'll apologize in advance to everybody here who is a Nigerian agent because, you know, in, in those high, high fraud countries, it can be very challenging. Uh, and they will have refusal rates that will be a little, you know, a little bit higher than what you see here. Uh, this is a 23% refusal rate. So, you know, 
with, with that in mind, I mean, I, I kind of want to start with the understanding that most students are going to get their visas. And so people need to take a deep breath and relax because, again, most students will get a visa. So with that in mind, what are the basic visa requirements? The first is you must have a residence abroad. What does that mean? That means that the student has to intend to return back to the home country when they're done with their program of study. So people will say, well, what if they're doing OPT or something like that? Uh, then can't they tell the consular officer that they want to work when they're done studying? Well, you can say that, but if you do, your visa will probably be rejected because it sounds like you're trying to immigrate to the United States on your student visa. A student visa is really for studying. And even OPT is really considered an extension of studying. So it's very important that you have a residence abroad, meaning the student plans to return home after they're done. Uh, the second thing is you have to be approved, you have to be accepted to study at an approved institution with a full course of study. So how do you know if your institution is approved? Well, if, if the institution can issue an I-20, then the institution is approved. The U.S. Department of State, uh, working with Homeland Security, uh, only I-20 issuing authority can be given to a school that's had a site visit and has had their accreditation verified. So if a school can issue an I-20, then it's an approved institution. The full course of study means that the student is going gonna, is gonna to study full time. And there's a minimum number of credit hours. Now, depending on whether you're attending uh, a semester-based program or a quarter-based program and that sort of thing, uh, that's you know between 11 and 12 credits typically to be a full-time student, depending on, again, if you're on a quarter system or a semester system. <clears throat> you also have to have sufficient funds to cover the first year of study and access to sufficient funds for subsequent years. So let's talk a little bit about that requirement because this is one that a lot of people get confused about. So sufficient funds to cover the first year of study means that when you read the I-20, it'll say tuition, cost of living, and other expenses, and there'll be a total dollar amount. The student really has to have that dollar amount in their bank account right now. That is, so the amount that the I-20 says they're required to have, that's the amount that they need to show in their bank account for the first year of study. Now, most students go for programs that are longer than one year. Even a master's degree is two. So if a student, you know, how do they show that they can afford those future years? Well, there's two ways they can do that. Either they have enough money in their bank account for the full program of study, or the family has income that is sufficient that it's reasonable to believe that the student will have access to the money that they need. And so they only have to be able to show access to sufficient funds for, for the future years and funds in the bank for the first year. So <clears throat> we're going to talk a little bit about 214B. Uh, and, and this is the number one reason why students get refused. So we've talked about the qualifications. Now let's talk about the biggest disqualification. The biggest disqualification is 214B. 214B is in reference to the Immigration and Nationality Act section that states that all people who are applying for a non-immigrant visa must prove to a consular officer that they do not intend to immigrate to the United States. Student visas are not immigrant visas. If you receive a student visa, then the consular officer who's interviewing you for that visa, they have to assume that you plan to illegally immigrate to the United States, and the student has to prove otherwise in the interview. If you can't prove otherwise, then they're going to refuse you, and you're going to be refused under Section 214B. A lot of times, people really don't understand this. They'll say, wait a minute, I did my interview and went really well, but they told me that it looks like I'm going to move to the United States, and I'm not moving to the United States. I just want to go to school. And, and this, is what, this is why they get that refusal, because the consular officer is legally obligated by law 
to assume that that student is trying to immigrate to the U.S. and must refuse them until the student proves otherwise. So how do you prove that you're going to come back? And this is where we get to my interview tips. <clears throat> when you go into your visa interview, the most important thing are the six bullet points that you see here. A lot of times people really don't understand what's happening in the visa interview, so hopefully I can help you to understand that today. When you go in and you have your interview, the consular officer is trying to understand, you know, is this person in front of me intending to move to the United States or work in the United States illegally? But they're also wondering, is this a terrorist? Is this someone who, you know, could try to do harm to the United States? So all of that is going through their head when you come in front of the window. So the best tool that the consular officer has to understand if you're a legitimate student or not is to interview you and see if your story makes sense. People who are lying, it's really hard for them to keep coming up with good lies that make, that make really good sense. Most people can't do that. And so consular officers will usually ask questions uh, about that person and why they want to go to school. So the first two bullet points here are be yourself and know your story. What does that mean? Be yourself means be honest. Go in and tell them precisely who you are. Don't try to pretend to be rich if you're not rich. Uh, just be yourself. Number two, know your story. Everybody has a story. Your story is really, you know, what is it about me that helps me make the choices that I make? In this instance, why are you going to that university? Consular officers will always ask, why do you want to go to that school? And they will also always ask, what are you going to do after graduation? So your story matters. Your story is how you overcome 214B. If a student goes into the embassy and they're interviewing and the consular officer says, why do you want to go to that school? And the student's response is, well, my parents and this agent, they really want me to go to this school. Well, this is a major life decision. So if somebody comes in and they know nothing about the school and they basically say, I'm only doing this because I have to, that's not very compelling. And it's not what you would expect from somebody who is about to spend $100,000 typically on tuition for a four-year undergraduate degree. So you know, usually when someone has that much money involved, they've taken the effort to learn about the school. Why that school? You know, some schools are different. Most schools are different from others. So why is that school important to you? What is it about that school? What is it about their programs? So a student who comes into the visa interview and they can't answer why they like that school more than other schools, well, something seems not right. And so you really need to be able to explain why you want to go to that school. The other thing that the students absolutely must be able to explain is what are they going to do when they're done with their program of study. That, if a student does not intend to return to their home country after they finish their course of study, if, they, if, if their plan is to try and immigrate to the United States, well, they shouldn't be applying for a student visa. They need to apply for an immigrant visa. And so, you know, your story needs to include why that school makes sense, but it also needs to say how that school is going to help you when you return home to get a good job, support your family. You really have to have a plan. A student must have a plan to return home and do something with that degree. If they don't, they're just not qualified for a visa. The other thing we say is smile. If you look nervous, I mean, look, everybody's a little bit nervous when they go in for the inner fidgeting. You do kind of wonder, you know, this is more than just normal nervousness. Maybe that person's hiding something. And so make sure that people smile. Just smile and, and, and be comfortable because, <clears throat> you know, you're, it, it doesn't help the student at all uh, if they're angry. Uh, or if they, you know, look really disgusted during the interview. The last, uh, the, the middle part here, this is the next part, part four, 
is make eye contact. Uh, when you're interviewing, if instead of looking at the interviewer, you look around and you don't make eye contact, you know, that's also really suspicious. Now, I know in some cultures, making eye contact with someone uh, who is in authority is considered disrespectful. Just tell your students, it doesn't matter if it's disrespectful in, our, in, in your culture. It's disrespectful in American culture if you don't make eye contact. So please make eye contact and keep eye contact, even if it's uncomfortable, because you're trying to be polite in an American context. And if you don't, it looks like you're trying to hide something. Uh, point five, answer all questions, honestly and completely. <clears throat> There's a couple of ways here in which agents have really hurt students. The first is agents sometimes have told students not to check the box if they have family or relatives in the United States. The problem with that is that quite often with family and relatives in the United States, the Department of Homeland Security is already aware that they are in the United States. And so when that student's application comes into the system, they already know that the parents or the siblings are there. So if you lie, it looks like you're covering something up. And if the consular officer believes you're lying about one thing, well, you could be lying about more than that, and they're going to refuse you. You're almost guaranteed a refusal if they catch you lying. And so just be honest, especially when it comes to questions about relatives in the United States. The next thing I would, I would just strongly recommend that you do is a part of the DS-160 asks did someone help you complete this form? Always, always, always mark that box a yes and put in the name of your agency if you're helping the student. Sometimes if there's a discrepancy where a student answers a question one way and, and the DS-160 has another, you're going to say to the student, wait a minute, you said that you have no family in the US, but right here it says you do. And they'll say, oh, I didn't fill that out. The agent filled that out. Well, it says here on the bottom that no one helped you fill it out, and you submitted it. So you're lying about no one helping you, and you lied about your family in the United States. You're not very trustworthy. The other thing that I want to really emphasize is that agents can develop a very good reputation in the embassy, where if you are an agent that consistently uh, helps good applicants to go in, uh, people will see and say, oh, that's a good agent. So, you know, putting on the form that you're helping people, that can actually really benefit you if you've developed a good reputation with the embassy. The number one way that an education agent can develop a good relationship with the embassy is if you become aware of consular fraud report it to the embassy. What I mean by that is if a student comes into your office or someone walks into your office and they say, I want to I wanna get to the United States. Can you help me to immigrate illegally? Can I use a student visa? As soon as someone asks you to do something illegal, go make a copy of their passport page, right? Have them bring their documents, make a copy, or get their information. Give that information to the embassy, say, hey, this guy came to my office and told me he and he's trying to immigrate to the U.S. or he's trying to do something related to U.S. immigration that's illegal. Explain to the embassy what happened and give them that person's information. If you do that, the embassy will see you as a credible person who's trying to help them do your work. All of those reports should be made to the Office of Diplomatic Security or the Regional Security Officer at the embassy where you're at. The regional security office, they're the guys who manage the embassy security as a whole, but they also help with consular security issues. So if you report it to them, they'll make sure it goes to the right place. Now, <clears throat> the last part, if you're refused, ask for a supervisory review. This is really important. You know, I've heard over the years of students getting rejected for some pretty stupid things that sometimes are even illegal. For example, uh, a student once had a consular officer say to them, wait a minute, this school is a bad university. 
Why do you want to go to such a bad university? Why aren't you going to a better school? Well, that's illegal. A consular officer cannot make a judgment on the quality of the school that you're going to. So if a consular officer says something like that that's weird or inappropriate, if for any reason you're refused, ask for a supervisor to review the case. I've heard of instances where, you know, consular officers said, well, why are you going to that school? That's not a good school, and they refuse someone. Well, there's no such thing as a blacklisted school. What can happen is that if you have a brand new consular officer, someone who, you know, they haven't worked at the embassy for very long, they're a brand new vice consul, maybe they're unfamiliar with local culture and customs, they may not understand how to read local bank statements and things like that, they can refuse you and make a terrible mistake and sometimes do things that are illegal. For example, tell you, hey, your school is a bad school, I wouldn't want to go to school there, and then they refuse you. They're not allowed to do that. That's against the law. But even if you are you know, refused for a good reason, still ask for a supervisory review. How do, so what is a supervisory review? When you ask, after you have been review, refused, if you ask for a supervisory review, the, the non-immigrant visa section chief must, by law, come to the window and review your case again. They will conduct a second interview on the spot. When they do that second interview on the spot, you may have it overruled. Typically, when someone asks for a supervisory review for a student visa, about half the time, or a little more than that even, the original decision will be overturned and the student will receive the visa. And so always, always, always ask for a supervisory review. So how do you do that? The student, let's say they're in the interview. They just found out that they're getting refused. And so they immediately, as soon as they tell you you're refused, say, well, I disagree. All you have to do is say to a consular officer, I would please like to have your supervisor review this decision. I'm asking for a supervisory review. So again, ask for the supervisor to come and review the decision. It's your right to have the supervisor come and check their work. So ask for it. Now, if the supervisor comes out, they will conduct the second interview. And at the end of that interview, if that supervisor refuses you, then you need to say to the supervisor will hand you your 214B letter usually and say, I'm refusing you under section 214B. But you should always ask the supervisor to give you three specific reasons why your case didn't meet the standard of 214B. Supervisors are usually better about explaining the problem with your case. They could say something like, it doesn't look like you have enough money. They could say, you do not appear to be a bona fide student. It, they could say that, you know, and there's a number of reasons why you could be uh, rejected, money, um, and that you're not a bona fide student. So, um, you know, if that's your case, if that's your problem, then, you know, now you have something specific and you can go back and apply. When you reapply for a visa, you always have to provide new information. So by finding out that specific reason on why they refused you, you can go and get new information that wasn't present in the first interview. So that when you go in, in different embassies, the way you reapply is different. In some embassies, reapplications are another interview. In some embassies, the reapplications are just done through paper. However, you always, when you reapply, you always need to say, here is new information that wasn't available in the first interview and include additional financial information, include additional information about why you want to go to that school and add some additional information about what you're going to do when you come home. If you do that, you have your best chance when you reapply of getting your visa. So I've kind of covered a lot of the issues that we were going to just discuss today. I'd like to open up the end of our time here so that if any of you would like, you could ask questions. I would like to point out right here, if you see 
this is a web address, http studentvisa.education. This is a student visa training course. There is an agent course, and there's also a course for students. That course and that training is free if you are a, an agent that represents our consortium. So all agents who represent our consortium and those students' agents, I'm sorry, their students and their sub-agents, all of them have access to the visa training course, and they have that access free of charge. For everyone who's not one of our agents, you have to pay for access to our training programs. Please use those as a resource. It gives you a lot more I mean, a lot more information on top of what we've done here today. So, with that in mind, I'm going to look down to the chat window and see if anyone here who's participating has any questions for me. All right, the first one. Uh, are the students interviewed in their mother tongue language or in English? Anna, that's a fantastic question. On the I-20 form, the I-20 form, uh, if the I-20 form does not say English not required for the program of study, they will almost always do the interview in English. Because one of the things you have to prove is that you're a bona fide student. So if your English isn't good enough, and you're going to a program where English is required, the inability to speak English, you can be refused. They'll say, look, you know, your I-20, it says, you know, that you're going to study nuclear physics, but I can't talk to you. You don't understand English well enough to talk to me. You can't do nuclear physics. You're not a legitimate student, and they will refuse you. However, particularly when students are going over to do language trade, oh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, when a student has language training, it will actually say on the I-20, English language proficiency not required. If you know that a student does not have to have English for their program of study, please verify as an agent that it says that on the I-20. If the school doesn't put that on the I-20, you need to go back to the school and request an additional I-20. Say, please send me an I-20 that says English proficiency not required. Because if it says that they don't have to speak English, then they will conduct the interview in their native language. And when they conduct the visa in that, you know, the visa interview in the native language, it's a lot easier uh, for the student. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's a great question. All right. So let's see, the next question is uh, show of funds. We just answered. Oh, how do you show funds in the bank account for the first year? Uh, which of all sources are acceptable? Ah, there's no easy answer to that question, Aparna, because there's different types of deposits in different countries. Uh, some countries have postal savings and insurance savings. Uh, some countries have regular checking and savings accounts. What's important is that in whatever country you are in, that the funds are immediately available. So it can't be like a certificate of deposit that will be cashed, you know, that, that you can't go in and immediately convert to cash. So it has to be a liquid investment of some sort. Uh, and you know, I would strongly suggest that that be like a savings account or a checking account with a foreign equivalent. And so just make sure that you have that money and that you can show it's immediately available. Uh, what is the percentage of refusals overturned by the supervisor? About half. About half the time the supervisor will overturn the decision. You know, and, I, and I'll be honest with you, where mistakes are made are almost always with a, with a new officer. So if you get a new officer that started within the past month or so, they tend to, it, they tend to have more refusals because they don't know what they're doing. And if you don't know what you're doing, it's easier to just reject a student for 214B. You have a whole bunch of interviews you have to do. And so, yeah, my, my, my suggestion is, yeah, if the student gets refused, please have them go back and ask for a supervisory review. If they do, they'll have, you know, a couple of, uh, uh, that, that, you know, they're going to have to have a couple of, uh, you know, I'm sorry, they're going to, you know, if you have the, if you have a supervisory review, you have that 50-50 chance of getting it overturned. Uh, next question, for the student with a passport valid for two years and they need a student visa valid for four years, 
Do they come back to the home country and redo the whole visa application? Uh, or do they pay the full visa fee? Or is there a less amount of fee they have to pay? No, no. This is actually very straightforward. So um, that student visa, uh, basically, they really should only give you a student visa that's valid for the duration of your passport. Sometimes they give you more than that. They're really not supposed to, but it's not something that's checked carefully. So just go on your passport. Uh, when you arrive in the United States, you can actually get a new passport without leaving the United States. So let's say that student goes to Los Angeles and their passport expires. They can go to their, to their consulate or embassy and they can get a new passport. Uh, what they have to do at that time is their school will help them to apply for a new visa to be put into their new passport. You send that to INS uh, through your school and the school will help you to reapply. Uh, you do have to submit it and pay the fee yourself, but there, there's, a little, there's some paperwork from the school. Uh, they also provide an electronic notification through SEVIS, uh, and then you mail it in and you get it back with your new visa in it. So do they have to pay the full visa fee if they're reapplying? Yeah, actually the fees are different in the United States. So uh, it will be a different fee than the fee that they pay in the embassy. It's going to be a lot cheaper. So when you apply for a visa in your home country, uh, that, those fees are on a reciprocity table. Sometimes those fees can be very high. If a student is already in the United States and, and they're changing their visa or getting a new one with a new passport, uh, they pay the basic visa fee. Okay. Uh, you've seen many times they ask two questions and don't listen and they give a refusal. Absolutely. And you know what the two questions are that they ask, Ron? They ask, why are you going to study in the United States and what do you plan on doing when you come back? And they refuse the student because the student can't answer the basic question. And, and I'm just, I'm being brutally honest with you, Ron. Uh, the two, those are the two questions they ask or versions of those two questions. What they really want to know is why do you want to go to that school? You know, typically if a student is going to school and you say, why do you want to go to that school? You know, they'll say, I want to become an accountant. And this school has, a, has an accounting program. It's affordable. I looked at three different accounting programs in the Washington, D.C. area because I wanted to go to Washington, D.C. I think it's a neat city. It'd be really fun to live in America's capital. You know, I can't get into Georgetown. It's too competitive. I looked at George Mason and the University of the Potomac. University of the Potomac is a lot more affordable for accounting. So I'm, I applied to and was accepted there, and that's why I want to go to school. I'm going to come back to my home country, and with a U.S. accounting degree, I can make a lot more money. And see, that makes sense. But when they ask the student, why do you want to go study at the school? And they say, I don't know. Or they say, mm, my parents are making me do it. Well, that doesn't sound like the, you know, the typical student. The students really have to be able to explain why that school instead of another school, and they have to be able to answer what they're going to do when they come home. A lot of times if the student, when they say, what are you going to do when you graduate? They say, I want to stay and work in the United States. If you say to a consular officer that you want to stay and work in the United States after your visa, they have to refuse you by law. They are legally bound to refuse you if you say you want to stay and work. You just can never say that. Um, can you type the visa training website? Uh, it's right in here, uh, studentvisa.education. I can type it in here at the bottom. It's uh, http colon slash slash studentvisa.education. If you are one of our, if you are one of our agents, you have access to that website for free. So just email Emma Morris, the organizer of our webinar, and say, "Hey, Emma, uh, could I please get a discount code so that I can use the stu the website for free?" She will give you a discount code that you and your students can use, so that when they go in to take the course, that they can immediately, you know, when they when they when they go in to sign up. They enter the code at checkout, and it, and it makes the course free. Okay? Now, and Emma has put her email address in here, emma at csuniversities.com. Email Emma. She'll get you access to the course. Okay. Uh, 
And the next question is, are fresh funds acceptable? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by fresh funds. If you mean money that was recently deposited, let me talk a little bit about what happens when money is recently deposited. Look, everybody at the embassy knows that there are people who give short-term loans to visa applicants to make it look like they have more money than they really do. Okay, Everyone at the embassy knows that they do that. So we're trying to figure out, are you, you know, where did that money come from? So if you have a recent deposit into your bank account, you need to be able to show where that money came from. So if you sold some stocks, if you sold some bonds, or maybe even sold some real estate so that you'd have that money, the student just needs to be prepared to show where the money came from so that they can say, yeah, this wasn't money that we just borrowed to make it look like we had enough money. You know, they need to be able to say, yeah, we sold a house or we sold some stock or something. So fresh funds are acceptable. However, you need to have paperwork supporting where the money came from that shows that it was from the applicant or their parents or something like that. Uh, if someone knew about his university and programs, even then they're getting a refusal. Why? Well, Rom, it's usually because the students, when they ask them what they're going to do, they don't say, I'm going to come. They, like the study plan doesn't make sense. So, so I'm going to give you an example. If a student says they're going to go to the United States and they're going to get a nursing degree, if U.S. nursing credentials aren't recognized in their home country, they're going to be refused. So the, if you go to the U.S. and you get a nursing degree and your home country doesn't recognize that credential, well, you can't come home and be a nurse. You have to stay and work in the United States. That student will be refused 100% of the time. Each student's case is different. But I promise you, Ron, uh, it, the student is saying something that's telling the consular officer that they are not a bona fide student or they intend to stay in the United States. Uh, that's just one example, but that's what's happening. All right. In case of a renewal of passport and visa uh, in the USA, uh, do they have to do another interview? No, they do not have to do another interview. So if you're already in the United States and you do a passport renewal and you need to get the new visa and your passport, it's not an interview. Uh, it, it's a mail-in. You get a form from the school that, that your school's designated school official uh, for international students. They'll get you a form. You fill it out. There's an address. You put it in an envelope with your payment, which is a, a check typically, uh, or, you know, or a cashier's check, and you send it off and they send it back to you and your visa's in it and it's really quite nice so you don't have to do another interview. It, it's, it's very painless. Uh, Ron, do we need more than one I-20 for visa success? No, 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 no. So this is a rumor and it's a rumor in more than one country that if you want visa success you need more than one I-20. It's the opposite, Ron. It is the exact opposite. Uh, I know that sometimes Education USA advisors will even tell students to have you know, more than one. Uh, Education USA, um, I'm trying to be polite when I say this. Education USA people have good intentions, but Education USA people are not trained with customs and border protection, and they're also not trained in the consular section to be vice consuls. And so if someone tells you, oh, yeah, get more than one I-20, that's a really bad idea. Because here's what happens. And I'll give, you a, I'll give you a very specific example. We had a student that wanted to come study at our school, USU, in San Diego. They were told by the agent that when they got to the border, if they had a handful of I-20s, it would make it easier for them to get into the United States. It did just the opposite. When they got to the border, they looked at all the I-20s and they said, wait a minute, you have all these I-20s? Why? Oh, you don't intend to go to that school. See, your visa, your student visa is very specific. It says the name of the school that you're going to be studying at. And so if, so the consular office, so, so I'm sorry, the customs official, the customs and border official said to this student, and she was a, 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 she was a very lovely young woman, uh, she was from Mongolia, and they literally said, your visa is for United States University in San Diego, but I can see, because you have all these I-20s, 
that you do not intend to go to that school. Therefore, I'm canceling your visa and revoking it, and we're sending you back. This happened last year to something like eh, five or ten students that I know of, where these students had more than one I-20, and, and, and that was the grounds of their refusal. So I do think that a student should apply to three or four schools because you know you want you want to try a challenging school that you might not get into and then have a couple of fallback schools that you know will accept you for admission however when it comes to getting i-20s you really should focus on the school that you really want to go to and and that should be the only i-20 that you get and that should be the only i-20 that you need uh, the more i-20s you get the more it looks like you're trying to immigrate or do something shady. So please, limit the I-20s. I, I beg you. I just know too many students who have got, uh, have had major problems because of that. Okay. Uh, Anna, should a student provide a detailed statement of account or just a bank certificate with a balance of available funds? You know, it really depends. Some consulates and embassies, they want to see your statements of account going back for a longer period of time. Some embassies and consulates, they just want to see the balance of available funds. You know, it really varies on, according to the country that you're in and what paperwork is available. I suggest that if you have a detailed statement of account, uh, if you have those for the past six months or something like that, that's best. Uh, so that you have a history with you. It just gives the consular officer some confidence that you know this money didn't just come in or they see large amounts coming in or out or something like that. So it gives them an idea that, you know, okay, this person can pay because it looks like over several months they've had good income. Um, next question. There's a rumor that a visa is issued depends on the state that the students apply to. Is that true? No, not true at all. Uh, the state that you apply to has no impact on your visa. Uh, what matters is what I said. A student has to know their story. They must be able to explain to the consular officer why they want to go to that school instead of any other school. They also have to be able to show that they're a bona fide student and that they have the means to travel. And that finally, they, the student has to have a plan on what they're going to do with their degree when they return to their home country. If you don't do that, then you don't, you know, those are the things you have to do. Uh, what state you're in, what religion you are, none of those things matter. I know that Muslim students are very sensitive to the belief that it's harder for a Muslim to get a visa, and that also is just not true. It's just not true. All right. What must be done when a student got her F-1 visa and then she did not go to study in her ESL program? Well, if you got a visa and you didn't go study, well then, you have a, you have a worthless visa sitting in your passport. Uh, you cannot use that to go study uh, you know, later. Uh, you can only use it for the program that you were applied to. And so, I guess nothing. You know, what you cannot do is try to travel on that F-1 visa to the U.S. to go on vacation or something like that. And so if you have an F-1 visa and you don't use it, that's okay. You can just ignore it. Uh, if a student has a visa rejection for some other country, does it affect their visa chances? No. No, it doesn't. Uh, in fact, you usually have no idea if that student was even refused at another country. Uh, the U.S. does share limited consular information with some countries, but for the most part, you know, they don't know and they don't really care because other countries' visa rules are different than the United States. And it may be that a student who doesn't qualify for a U.K. visa might still qualify for a U.S. visa. So no one really cares if you are refused in another country. They just want to see, you know, if you meet the requirements for the United States. Uh, can a student go to Canada on a U.S. visa and look for a job there? So um, if you have a U.S. F-1 visa, you know, you can go uh, to the U.S. and study. Yeah, you can't work in the United States other than OPT, CPT, or if authorized by the school, up to 20 hours a week, right, of work. However, uh, can you go to Canada and look for a job? I don't know the answer to that question because I'm not a Canadian consular officer. Uh, 
Uh, I think that it depends on what country you're from, if you can legally work in Canada or not. Some countries, they're allowed to go to Canada and work. So, for example, if you're from the UK, uh, you know, you can go to Canada and you can work. Uh, it's also very easy for US citizens to go work in Canada, but for every student, for every country, that's going to be different. So you'll need to look up the rules for, for students going and working in Canada uh, from your country, and I just don't know that. I'm not a Canadian diplomat. OK, any other questions? <clears throat> Okay, fantastic. So I just want to thank everybody for uh, coming out tonight in Arizona. So whether it's, if it's the morning where you are, good morning then, have a fantastic day. If it's the afternoon, I hope you have a great afternoon. And if you're with me in the Western Hemisphere in North America, uh, have a wonderful evening. Uh, also, one last thing, you know, if any of you would like to work with our schools, we have a consortium of five incredible universities. Uh, it's five schools with one agent agreement. Uh, we would love to work with you. Uh, Emma, Emma Morris, who set up this webinar, she'd be happy uh, to work with you. And please, uh, we'd love to hear from you and let you know what you thought of the webinar. So have a fantastic evening. Oh, F1 visa and B2. OK, there's one more question here. And it's actually a really good question. I'm going to answer it really quickly. What is the difference between an F1 visa and a B2 for education? That's a very good question. Let me answer that very quickly. Uh, you may study in the United States on a B2 tourist visa. You can only do that if you study less than 15 hours a week and if the course that you're studying does not have a diploma or a certificate for completion and it does not grant credit to a degree granting institution. So uh, that's called uh, study incidental to tourism. And there are programs right now that specialize in that. Uh, ah, student visas in San Diego. If you're interested in a San Diego school, talk to Emma Morris on this call. She can help you. Uh, Natalia, she's more than happy to help you. Uh, we represent uh, United States University in San Diego, and we'd be happy to help your students there. So everyone, good night, good afternoon, or good morning, depending on where you are. And uh, have a great time. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>